February 2017, I was in Mumbai at the World HRD Congress. The room was full, 400 people of global executives, and I've asked one question to them. I would like to ask it to you as well. When it comes to making great decisions, what are you using? Your brain? Your heart? Or your gut? Just by a show of hand, who's using their brain? Yeah? That's good news. Thank you. <laughs> who's using their heart? Yeah, some people are using their brain and their heart. Okay. And then I'd like to see the core. Who's using their gut? Yeah, right on, excellent. Well, when it comes to leadership, tough decisions must be made sometimes on the spot, sometimes after sound reflection, sometimes using data, sometimes using feedback. I'm working with C-levels. My work is to listen to their concern, their challenges, to set goals with them, set a vision, and get them move forward they own all of the answers. I'm not there to tell them what to do. I'm there to hold the space. And what I have observed through my years of coaching, I've been a coach, an executive coach in Shanghai since 2008 when I arrived. And um, what I've realized is all of the, the clients I've worked with, they go down the curve. It's a curve where they're motivated to make something happen and then they hit a roadblock. Most of the time after maybe a month or two after they enroll in the coaching process. And then when it becomes a little bit harder, what people realize is that it takes a lot of energy to overcome these challenges. Now, you might wonder what's the link with food, eh? The last six years, I've embarked on a self-study journey. I've uh, read books and read about two or three medical articles about gut, digestive system, neuroscience, and the science of behaviors, leadership. Now, if you look on Amazon, you will find this book pretty easily, very interesting to see that there is a connection, there's a real connection between your gut and your brain. And I'm going to tell you what it is. You will, you will better understand what it is and how it functions for you as well. How you can make it support you. This is the kind of food that we very often see at the canteen, right? When I go to Fortune 100 companies, sometimes it looks like that as well. So you won't be too lost in a few years from now, right? What happens after, though, you come back to work or you come back to your classroom and then you fall asleep. You think maybe it's because you're too busy and then you didn't sleep well the night before. But in fact, what is going on is that your digestive system is working so hard to digest that food that it has to use the energy from your central neural system and the internal neural system, right, that is it's actually using the bandwidth that you need just to function normally. And so, can you imagine when you, it comes to making great decisions, sometimes it's really hard, mostly towards four o'clock in the afternoon, to keep going without a coffee, for instance. Okay? Mm -hmm. You see, I see the head nodding. You can make that happen, like that shift, you know, can really happen. I made it happen six years ago when I realized I was not in such a good shape, although I was an athlete and I was training really hard, uh, competing, eating like, you know, the nutritional, nutritional code uh, in Canada, and, but it was not suiting me. And this is something today I hope you will leave with, the fact that it's not a diet and I'm here to sell you. It's really some food hygiene instead. So, you see, <clears throat> what I'm saying here is that food can definitely take energy away from you and deprive you over time from your brain full function, 
okay? And over time, it also creates what we call inflammatory diseases in your body. And let's say through the age of maybe mid-40, mid-50, you might not even know what those symptoms are like, but you might suffer from them. You know, just like nose dripping all the time, itchy ears, uh, itchy eyes, uh, mouth dry. Um, it could be as well dry skin or skin issues. Uh, other kind of uh, disease that can happen, we call that very often the IBS syndrome, where you're all constantly between, sorry for saying, but diarrhea versus constipation, which is kind of very uncomfortable, isn't it? So if you, if you start realizing there's a connection between those, those uh, thing, things that you eat and the way that you think, you might want to consider changing the way that you eat in order to think differently. I'm sure that you've heard that saying, we are what we eat. Well, that talk is also, let's say, portraying the journey that I've gone through over the past six years when I realized I was not such in good shape, although I was a kayaking athlete, okay? And um, coming to Shanghai was a great challenge. It has increased the level of stress, and in my body, the antioxidant system didn't work enough. It was not sufficient to reduce the waste. And uh, what happens is, you know, what happened is, it became too much polluted inside, kind of too much inflammation, not enough, you know, space to, let's say, have good nutrients going through the nervous system and so on. And it might be your case as well. So what I realize is, I, I have achieved 10 national titles, and out of them, seven were made with a lot of effort and concentration, determination, controlling my mind, making sure my mind would not sabotage my race, making sure that I would have an internal speech that is supporting to myself. So let's imagine you're going to an exam and you're not sure if you studied enough or not, but you have this internal speech going on all the time. Believe it or not, this might be triggered by the food that you eat. The moment you change that, what happens is you're going to achieve potentially the same result, but with much less effort. Much less effort managing your thoughts, much less effort managing the responses in your entire body. Now let me take you into a journey, okay? A journey inside of your body. And this is also very important for me as a coach to trigger the fact that I'm not here to give you any answers on how your body works. You know better than I do. I'm not here to tell you what to eat and what not to eat. Your body knows better than I do, okay? But what I would like today is to trigger your desire to listen to what your body has to say because over time, your body is going, is going to ask you for different things. Maybe one morning it'll be a banana, maybe another day it will be um, a whole plate of uh, spaghetti or fruits or whatever. So listen to what your body is asking for because it tells you something about what's going on inside as well. Now, I know some people are craving for, you know, less good food than that. Um, there's an explanation for it as well. So let's say the food that you eat comes into your body and when it goes into your gut lining, there's the uh, the entire, let's say, let's call the, 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 the central neuron system here in your brain functioning, managing, it's like the headquarter, okay? It's managing everything that is going on in your body, and this is connecting with the, um, the ENS system. So that system is kind of behind, you know? It goes through your spine here at the back, it goes down through your, your um, vague, um, vague nerve here, and it connects to your colon and sacral, okay? So this has actually, let's say, it's like wires that are going into your gut lining. And when you eat food, the food goes down into your 
intestine and it breaks down, it breaks down in small particles. It's like the enzymes of what you have chewed, right? You have, you, you chew in your saliva creates three type of enzyme and these enzymes then are cutting down the food into proteins and these proteins are going down into the lining, into the lining, it goes up into the nervous system into chemicals such as uh, serotonin, for instance. And that helps the brain to connect the neurotransmitters together. These are the messengers saying to the brain, we've got the power that we need. Let's say the serotonin is like the quiet e guys, you know? They're like the quiet e guys going from the gut and driving up to the brain and saying, okay, guys, we have the energy, we have the energy to, to to function, to make the body work through homeostasis. Homeostasis is, is this body function that works naturally. You don't need to think about having your heart beating, having your breath going on. You don't have to think about, let's say, rejuvenating your skin, your, your hair growing. This is all happening by itself. But that bandwidth of energy, you need to have it, right? If you don't, then it starts being a problem. You have a hundred thousand million neurons in your brain that are connecting with your gut as well. So very often in the medical science, we call the, I wouldn't say we because I'm not a doctor, but what I've read is that um, the, the gut lining is called like the second brain, literally, okay? And what is going on is in your, in your gut lining, you have bacteria as good and bad guys, and the good guys are from the food that is alive, you know? Just like a plant-based old food that is raw, for instance. The moment you cook it or, or overcook it, then it kills the enzyme and it kills its nutrients. It becomes like dead food. Your body will feel full, but it won't send back to the brain what it needs to function and create better networks of, you know, networks of thoughts and patterns and so on, which all impacts on your mood, on your sentiments, on your uh, thinking, on your behaviors, literally. Now, the, the latest research about the gut science is that we have microbiotas on all of our body, and as we are aging, if we're exposed to, if we're exposed to different food or not, it is going to change even our DNA because the microbiota are entering into our body and it's feeding, it's the, the guys that are feeding our body. These are just like distributors of all of the good resources that we have. But if we eat more processed food, what happens is these guys have nothing to give. Right? And, and when it comes to this level, it can even deprive an impact on your DNA. It's uh, what we call the epigenetic, and it has been a, the most recent uh, search found back in 2015. So you have to look into the, um, you have to look into the emotional intelligence to fully understand the impact of food on leadership. What happens is, when you want to connect with someone, you can use your intelligence, of course, but from your heart perspective, you're going to relate to someone. You're going to feel the emotions. But if your brain is too busy, let's say, digesting still the food that is in your gut, or doesn't have enough energy to sustain the, the whole network activity here, what is going to happen is that it will shut down a little your emotional intelligence. If you have inflammation in your, in your body, you're not aware of it, it even might create some snappy reactions. And when you work in coaching, what we see happening is that people have shifting behaviors. It's like, okay, no, I'm not under stress, so I can be very comfortable in this discussion and forthright diplomatic. But then the moment I'm put a little bit under pressure with already the stress that is going on in my body, you know, the, the depriving of nutrients and so on, then what can happen? Now I'm put on a threat. And what happens when I'm put on a threat? I fall into the fight-flight mode. 
This is a primal response, and that primal response is decreasing your ability to relate with people. So imagine a leader that has a very difficult decision making, and, and then they feel like there's time pressure, and there's some, uh, let's say, conflict in their team. Everything comes on top of that. You go for a business lunch, and the business lunch is at some canteen where the food is not good. In the afternoon, what are the chances that this individual can take good decisions? Very low, right? even after taking a coffee. So what I'm saying to the executives I'm working with is based on the leadership assessment I'm making with them, when I see them coming at the beginning of the session, they have some potential bandwidth they can release just by changing slightly the way that they eat. Okay, and actually the, the Nobel Prize who has discovered uh, cancer has realized that in a pH alkaline body, there's no disease that can develop and the body is fully relaxed. So I would say look into the food that is uh, perhaps like more natural and the tricks that I'm going to give you right now, I think it's one thing you should look into if you really want to free up that bandwidth for yourself. Eliminate some food that doesn't feel good for you. Eliminate food that your body tells you, mm, I know everyone's eating it, but I think for me it doesn't work and it's okay. All right? So what is it? Very often, processed dairy, processed food package, processed meat, processed bread, and Maya reaction. The Maya reaction is when you burn, you burn the food, it looks good, right? And it's good. But in fact, it creates a lot of glycotoxin in your body, and that glycotoxin is pollution. You must eliminate, more ways to eliminate. So what are, and you know, in China, there are so many people that are more and more sick, from uh, diabetes, for instance, which is an autoimmune disease, which can be totally, totally eradicated with the food hygiene that I'm gonna tell you here. Now, it takes time to make that food transition between three months to a year. And I would say go step by step because you will go back to your old habit and then try again new habit and go back to your old habit just to see, is it right that those things were not good for me? Then I would say follow your gut because it tells you exactly what you need. I have six, 60 plus executives who are following me on a daily basis on what I eat and they are making a transition themselves on eating more healthy and it has proven result for them already. Now, my message for you today is small steps. Small steps to free up some energy bandwidth, be more clever, not from the IQ, but from the EIQ, Chew 20 times to develop those three enzymes you need that will break down the proteins, will send up to your brain and create the perfect wire that you need to make decisions. And then the protein, don't eat too much. If you eat too much of them, more than the size of your palm, it will putrefy in your body. It will create headaches and skin problems and fog in your brain. So it's very important, take care of that. And the hypotoxic is a way that you cook your food, steam it not too long right, instead, or stir fry it, which creates the Maillard reaction I showed you just before. And the last one is pay attention to whole, whole alive food, because that one wants you good, creates the good guys in your gut lining, and these good guys won't make you starve anymore.